Um, yes. Um. <coughs> Um, when someone says, be good, be kind, uh, you're a good person, um, you seem like a nice person. Um, it's very difficult to, I think, accept that, I think. And that's the same thing when we do, or when we try to perform these practices, it's very, very difficult to accept that I can take refuge, you know. I, this person, can um, generate bodhicitta. Um, it's not really possible. <coughs> because um, uh, it's, how do you say, this habit of going from one extre- from going from one extreme to the other is such that um, mm, we cannot really uh, trust ourselves we cannot really believe ourselves that we can do anything almost and so according to that spirit then to really to believe that um, i can wake myself up i can die consciously it's um, very, very foreign. And so I think that's where this challenge comes from. So I'm not here to say as if there is some form of spiritual decree that um, we must do it in, as if there's a sense of mission that we have to do it to save the planet we have to do this to save ourselves from global warming, from pollution, from a non vegetarianism <laughs> you know um, and, and and there are so many other things but <coughs> the um, pure and the genuine reason why we are all here is is to shake things up, really. Some of us are too religious and some of us are not. Some of us are too intellectual, some of us are too political and we are all extreme from one another. And this meditation, this practice, this setting, whether it looks uh, mm, organized or not, whether it is conspired or not, um, I do know one thing, that through this practice, or these practices, in plural, that they have the ability to uh, help us shake things up, really, shake things up completely, to turn everything upside down, to make us sick to the very core of ourselves, um, to make us confused, disoriented, uh, from, I don't know, from any point. And I would say that this is very helpful. Unlike any other disorientation experiences, this is one that we do it consciously, you know, whatever that means, but nevertheless we are trying to do it consciously. We are trying to sort of somehow develop some form of schizophrenia by thinking that we are the genetic, you know, the four-armed man. Um, <laughs> and um, I don't know what kind of uh, paintings or images or tankas or statues you have, if you really look at it, it looks from every point um, disproportioned, you know. It's almost like a cartoon because it's only the cartoon uh, or comics that have actually very big head and very small body. 
And if you look at every painting of in the Tankas, and if you look at every statue of ours, unless they are from different kind of orientation, the head portion is really big. <laughs> Just look. <coughs> but there is a cuteness to it. <laughs> it's like watching a baby, you know. Babies have actually a very big head. I've realized that now, personally. <laughs> and very small body. And the reason why we don't like each other as adults, why we have so much ego against each other, is because the head had become small and the body <laughs> had become big. <laughs> and it looks strange, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> so, is to shake things up. If you look at each other, it's like looking into a mirror, you know. I know you <laughs> because you have a small head. So do I. <laughs> so um, it's nice to think of ourselves with bigger heads. <laughs> so that's the point. Is to shake things up. So um, through this strangely either tragical or humorous or uh, comical sort of process of shaking things up, then what happens is that um, all the seriousness is gone. That's the thing. Meaning seriousness in a way that, oh, I'm so good, I'm, <laughs> I'm better than you. Um, I have better nose than you. I have bigger eyes than you, and all that. Um, uh, somehow, it's gone. It's not forced out consciously. It's not uh, gone by itself. For some reason, it's gone. And the other aspects that when we think that oh, I'm, mm, I'm the last, and uh, I feel that I'm the worst and so on, same thing, uh, that also goes away. Because some, for some reason we don't know where to go between those two. Either we think we are the best or we think we are the worst, you know, constantly. From every minute, every second, we are constantly doing that, you know. <coughs> and so, um, by doing something that is completely irregular, yet somehow consciously, then uh, it shakes things up. Yeah. And then something happens. And that's why we were able to laugh for now, let's say, you know. Um, that's why I think uh, individuals who have understood a sense of this, they are not afraid to get angry in a way. Because they can understand that when you're angry, you're being very honest. Like we all know, yes, at the back of our mind, that if we can uh, tickle somebody or uh, tick somebody in according to that person's emotion, that we can get anger out of that person, you know. And when we do that, we can find out the secret. We can find out what this person is thinking, what this person is feeling, what are his or her true emotions, you know. So, uh, real spiritual people actually understand that, um, actually they kind of find it interesting to get angry, or to get sad, or to get happy sort of thing. Yeah. So that's the whole thing. Um, that's why uh, I love these songs of Melarepa where he says something along the line that if one gets sick, then I will be happy to get sick. If I die, I will be happy to, to die, you know. 
he's not being pessimistic at all. He's not being negative. He's not being sort of drowning himself in mo emotion and sort of putting himself down. But he's really understanding that um, uh, every aspect of emotions that occurs which you cannot control at all, you know. Um, we are laughing here right now and the next minute we are crying, you know. And the next minute we are angry, the next minute we are jealous, the next minute we are egotistic. Um, <coughs> but somehow we have no way of um, controlling them or even forecasting them. You know. So um, it's like saying, when we say accept, accept our karma. Uh, in Tibetan we say le dagri or you know to ex to to make your karma your own. That's I think a loose translation of it. Um, it's very profound to make karma your own. In other words, it's not a religious thing to say to 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 make your karma your own. What it means is that. This karma cannot be altered at all. Even if you are enlightened, you cannot. Um, even if you are the Buddha Shakyamuni, let's say, he couldn't con sort of change his own directions also, you know, let alone changing someone else's direction. But one's own direction cannot be changed. But one thing you can do is go together with that current flow together with that current. Yeah. Like what Milarepa said, if your current is to get sick, if your current is to fall short in life, then go together. Go with it. Yeah. Not because you are too happy, not because you are too sad, but or not because it's the right thing to do, you know. So there's all these ideas um, are not completely disregarded, you know. Meaning that there are so many individuals who are trying to do the right thing. That doesn't mean that we have to have a mission to set them, set them uh, on the right course by saying that, hey, uh, what you're doing is wrong. We don't have to say that. Even though we see that maybe that's the wrong course of action. We just let them be. That's their own course sort of thing. And we let them on their course. But we have the kind of devotion, or sorry, the courage to accept that that's their course, this is sort of my course, or this is our course. We kind of have the courage to accept it in a most natural way. Not in a positive way, but in a most natural way. Yes. So if you are able to do that, or if you understand what that means, maybe it has the potency to help us understand what refuge means. Because um, to most of us as Tibetans or practitioners, we are so used to the idea of taking refuge. Um, maybe to most countries also in Southeast Asia or any part of Asia where Buddhism was very popular, that re taking refuge is so normal that it's part of the, the political sort of aim and the social aim and the religious aim that I want to be dominated, you know. And you almost feel a sense of pleasure in that because if you think about it in a religious point of view, basically means that you don't have to do anything, the state will take care of it, you know, or the system will take care of it. system will take care of your purification, the system will take care of your health, everything, your liberation, whatever. So <coughs> we are used to that and so therefore whenever we think of refuge, it's very, very easy. Some of us do understand what it means, some of us don't. Yes. But to most of you, I, I'm 
I'm curious in terms of maybe you don't feel that, feel the same way. That um, actually taking refuge might sound very negative to you, you know. If you feel that, good. You should feel that way. But at the same time, um, not over the top deny that feeling. Uh, let that reaction, um, compulsory sort of reaction or natural reaction that comes up, let it rise, but watch it and observe it. Because it's true. Uh, maybe from a certain point of view, a certain kind of upbringing and growing up, maybe taking refuge is the worst thing, actually, you know. It means um, you, you don't uh, give yourself any power, any control. And so therefore, according to that uh, uh, sense, feeling, then actually you don't like it. <coughs> so allow yourselves to feel that at the same time. Don't over the top deny that, yes. And then if you do that, then somehow you will, um, not to say you will, but a c an opportunity will present itself for you to really understand what refuge really means. What generating kindness or courage or bodhicitta really means. Then it could happen on its own without having to be told, without having to be explained, on its own, something will happen. <coughs> then a genuine kind of question might come up also, a kind of question that you have never felt before, which is not driven um, by a sense of mission, a um, sense of um, perfection, right or wrong, but a very genuine question in terms of uh, you really begin to um, enjoy that idea, enjoy that um, pattern of, I don't know, way of living, one could say, that has, um, that is not, I don't know, um, uh, altered by social expectations. Yes, that we have to live long, we have to live healthy, we have to live successful, uh, we have to live strong, we have to be brave and all that. And um, then those questions, when they come up on its own, naturally, obviously, uh, we don't have to fear the Mm, the answers will come, the answers will naturally come. <coughs> Otherwise, yes, of course, uh, when we are brought up in, I don't know, whatever form of school, of course, uh, we, are, we have to be thankful that we are living in a very sort of enlightened era, where we have freedom of spree, speech, freedom of this and that, but we don't know what that means. We are taught to ask all sorts of unnecessary questions, but where will they lead, lead to, you know? And um, then those who are supposed to answer those questions, they also have to be constantly in panic in, uh, to, to constantly prepare. What if that question comes up, then what should I say? Um, so that it's politically correct, so that is religiously correct, philosophically correct, you know. So um, that's, that could happen. I'm not saying that we are living in such um, state of disarray, but it could happen. And so, <coughs> therefore, I ask all of you to um, have a good time today, although it's very late, but nevertheless to have a good time in terms of um, 
um, <coughs> take refuge in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha. Um, joyfully, you know, with real joy. That whoever became the Buddha, whoever understood the Dharma, whoever encouraged the, the so-called Sangha, that uh, they did it without a single doubt, um, in terms of success, finding success or trying to avoid failure. And there, therefore they got old, how do I say this, um, peacefully. And they got sick peacefully and they died peacefully. Tata gata. I don't know. I hope I will not be scolded, but probably that's the one way of saying it, you know. The word Tathagata means those who have gone that way, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, the way they have left or the way they have gone is such that they didn't fight with any of those processes. On top of it, they did something extra which is called the bodhicitta, yes, that uh, they were able to, in, in fact, enjoy those stages with tremendous almost passion because they felt that uh, they were going through those processes for someone's sake or for everybody's sake. We could say that that's an absolute hallucination but they didn't care. They felt that that was it. <coughs> and so therefore, that's um, mm, the kind of attitude. If he can develop, it's good. If he cannot, no pressure. So, um, more than the, uh, how do you say, the sudden, the, f uh, formula itself of the Chinesic um, sadhana, those two aspects are very important, refuge and generating of bodhicitta. Refuge so that um, we give in, actually, we give in. Um, of course, the motivation is for the sake of sentient beings, but all in all, we are giving in. We are giving in to our aging. We are giving in to our sickness. We are giving in to our death. And um, we do this uh, not because we are religious, not because we are spiritual, not because we are uh, scientists or doctors or mm, law enforcement or anything. We just do it because um, that's what everything else beside our, us are doing, you know. Meaning, if you like to think of someone, animals, that's what they're doing. Or if you like to think of something, then every living thing, that's exactly what they have been doing, that's what they have done, that's what they are doing, probably that's what they will do. And we are the only ones who are somehow negating that. So therefore, we take refuge by sort of, to mo in order to have a motivation, we have to have some form of objective, yes, some form of a target. And for that, it's most motivational to think of someone like ourselves. That's why we have an image of a person. Image of a person uh, who have overcome all of that with tremendous courage, but not, it's, it's not an image of someone like Hercules, let's say, like lifting the whole world up like a superman, you know, with all the muscles sort of and veins popping up, but doing, with, doing it with immense courage by sitting 
extremely calm and composed. So that's why the Im mm, we have on almost every altar an image of a Shakyamuni Buddha to show that courage doesn't mean that you have to ha be tough or you have to be muscular or uh, you have to be like Zeus, you know. <laughs> um, you can be an ordinary person and um, you can do it. So to entice us then we Im um, I think of a, a real person, living, breathing person. Um, if you like to add on top, in terms of it has a halo, or it is transparent, or holographic, all that, it's up to us. But deep down, it's a person, a living, breathing person like ourselves, who, have, who has all, every reason to fail every reason to fail at any second actually yes so that person and that person's realization is the so-called the refuge of buddha then his or her um, intent that's the thing or aspiration is the dharma